For the past 18 years, George Page has been bringing natural history to television audiences with his Emmy Award-winning Nature series on PBS. Inside the Animal Mind is Page's first book, and it addresses issues close to his heart. As a companion to an extraordinary three-part series of the program, this book explores a cutting-edge research into animal intelligence. Here is a look at Inside the Animal Mind. A rat, a maze, and a test. The classic starting point in the investigation of animal intelligence. Yet for all our years of study, it's a field full of speculation and debate. When I first observed a chimpanzee at Gombe using an object as a tool, there was a sense of disbelief because at that time we were supposed to be the only tool using and tool making animal. A dog can't speak to me, he cannot communicate with me, except physically, he can't verbally communicate with me. But that does not stop his brain working. Animal brains come in every shape and size. Each one is full of surprises. But the mind is more than a problem solver. It also holds fear and pleasure. The sea is not full of cold fish at all. They're out there, they're having a darn good time. They get tickling during the day, they get sex in the afternoon. Everything is probably a pretty good place. They have a lot of pleasure. And yet to know happiness means to know suffering as well. You know, sometimes when I look into her eyes, I think she's a very sad person, really. We don't know what horrible uh, trauma had taken place in her past, but something. If animals hold on to memories of trauma, they are also capable of profound trust. No two. I recognize what they are. I never forget that they're wild animal. But you go to great efforts to develop this trust and bond. And the trust is based on Two minds, two minds of different species understanding each other. But could animal understanding go even deeper to an awareness we call consciousness? Watching elephants with their bones leaves me with little doubt that they have a sense of self, that they have an understanding of their own mortality. I am pleased to have George Page back on this program to talk about this extraordinary series and the companion book that goes with it. Welcome back. Thank you very much, John. Uh, a couple of things. One, that was not your voice. That was Steve Croft's voice, right. who's the narrator for this series. And secondly, uh, you've had some difficulties with your throat, right. which I, prevents I, you from I'm doing a, as much uh, as you used to. Exactly. I'm a survivor. I okay. had uh, throat cancer, uh, and it's completely gone, and I'm okay. Matter of fact, I had an examination yesterday, and it's, it's fine. However, the radiation, the treatment for it, um, left me... With, you know, for a while I couldn't talk, <laughs> um, but left me with a very hoarse and raspy sound. So I apologize for that. But yeah, uh, it's that getting be, better. Will that continue to improve? They think? say that it will. Yeah, but it certainly is slow. I tell you <laughs> that. <laughs> tell me about this series, Inside the Animal <clears throat> Mind. Uh, you talk about. You raise this question: What do we know, really, about animal intelligence? What do we know, really, about animal emotions? What do we know really about animal consciousness? Well, they're all tough subjects, and um, they were not considered um, uh, worthy of scientific inquiry until really fairly recently, about uh, 25, maybe 30 years ago, was when uh, Donald Griffin of Harvard uh, came along and, and wrote a book called The Animal Mind and, and did... Uh, uh, some where he's famous for having discovered um, echolocation in uh, bats as a, their way of communicating. In any case, um, he really started a so, sort of whole new uh, movement called cognitive ethology. This is the uh, academic term for it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, since then, uh, many, many uh, people have, have begun to study uh, the animal mind. It is uh, no longer 
uh, not respectable to, to, to study it. So the point is <clears throat> that we have learned uh, a great deal about animal intelligence. And I think the first, probably the most important thing to understand is that um, <clears throat> animal brains all work alike, including ours. We have a wonderful scene uh, in these programs where <clears throat> a classic experiment was uh, recreated where some chimpanzees were introduced to um, this enclosed area. Uh, out, it was outside, and there was a, uh, a string put way up high with a banana dangling yeah. off that string. <clears throat> and you know, chimps obviously couldn't couldn't reach that banana. In the um, enclosure, they placed uh, crates, wooden crates, and they placed a, a stick, a fairly long stick. You actually can see the chimps, and one in particular who assumes the Rodin thinker <laughs> pose, looking at that banana, looking at the boxes. <laughs> Finally looking at that stick, no, later looking at that stick, but then going over and picking up a box, putting it under the banana. Then he puts another box. He tries to get on top of it. It's not tall enough. He brings a third box. He gets on The thing falls down. It's hysterical, actually. It's really very funny. Uh, <clears throat> finally, he, manage he sees the stick and picks up the stick. He manages to crawl up on the uh, three boxes, and he jumps and hits the banana with a stick. All right, let, we've got that. Right. <laughs> From inside the it. animal mind, here is that clip right here. How can the chimps reach the banana, their favorite food? Will they resort to trial and error? Or can they imagine a solution through insight to claim the banana? The means of reaching the banana are all available. And one chimp, Marka, seems to have thought of a solution to the problem. She sets out to gather up the necessary equipment. Marka's purposeful air suggests that she has the solution in her head. She has only to execute her plan, and the banana is hers. <laughs> How great are those chimps? <laughs> so you can't say that animals that don't think and plan. Um, maybe it's not too surprising with the uh, chimpanzee, which is our closest uh, living relative, but it's been observed uh, in all the way down, I shouldn't say down to, but it's been observed in birds. Now, what's this thing? I, I want to talk about birds in a minute, but what's this thing with the hummingbird? we got some video of that. But what's this thing about the raven and the fishing line? That was uh, what I was thinking about, as a matter of fact. Um, in Sweden, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, ice fishermen would, um, would leave their lines overnight, overnight in the, the hole. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> the, they would come back the next day and, and they're... <laughs> Lines had been pulled out, and their fish had been stolen. Yes. And they couldn't figure it out. They thought, you know, who in the village would do something yeah, like right. this? They didn't realize we had thieves <laughs> as neighbors. So finally, they one, this one guy staked out the, the ice hole, you know. <clears throat> and lo and behold, you know, came these ravens. <laughs> yeah. And they would pull it out. They would pull it out. And they, what they would do is they would take it in the line in their beak, they would pull it, and then they'd put a... Uh, a, you know, a claw on it, a yeah. foot on it, and then pull out some more and put the other foot so they could keep that line, you know, up. <laughs> yeah. And finally they'd get to the fish, and, I mean, get the fish would be there, and they'd pull it out over onto the ice and, it's great. and eat it uh, and <laughs> take it away. And pigeons can tell the difference between Monet and Picasso. <laughs> well, that's what the, um, uh, what the uh, experiments uh, uh, have shown, that they uh, have extraordinary visual uh, acuity, and um, and can in fact in in test, uh, you know, pick the Monet button or the <laughs> or the Picasso button yeah. um, <laughs> to get some some food. Your bias, your bias, is in favor 
you're enthusiastic about the idea, and I mean biased by the conclusions you have reached based on what you have seen. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I feel that it's very good to be close to the other animals with whom we share um, this planet. I, it gives me a good feeling, a feeling of, of, um, of continuity. And it's, you know, it, it's hard for us as a species <clears throat> to come uh, to the realization that we have so much more in common with them than our cultural and scientific heritage would have led us uh, to believe. And <clears throat> it's my hope, of course, that uh, as people began to to feel that way, um, that they'll start treating animals better yeah. you know, and saving them for future generations. You and I have known each other for a long time. In the 70s, I think. Yeah, uh, a long time, I care to admit. <laughs> I have known you as an NBC News correspondent with distinguished service around the world. I've known you as a programming executive at public television, my flagship station, WNET. And now this. Uh, did you come to nature simply as a broadcaster fronting a program and this love for the subject matter has grown or was this something that you very much wanted to do because it was an extension of existing interest? Well, it was a little of both, uh, to be honest. Uh, <clears throat> I've always had a tremendous love for animals and I've always, when I could and wasn't traveling all over the world, I always have pets, dogs, and cats, and <laughs> you name it. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and I've, I've, I've loved uh, nature. Um, uh, but it was quite clear about 18 years ago that uh, one of the uh, kinds of programs that did very well with the audiences were natural history programs. So as a programmer, I set about trying to figure out how we could get a regular uh, weekly series on the air because there wasn't one. And, um, you know, it, now there's so many <laughs> on you just wonder, you know, if the goose that laid the golden egg is, you know, just going to yeah. fly away. Because, but the audience, Charlie seems to have an insatiable appetite for this kind of material. And I suspect it has to do with um, something of a rebellion against our modern world, where we are so far away from nature yeah. and the natural yeah. world. Yeah. And especially people in cities, you know, who seem to be who live in concrete jungles and seem so far away from nature. And I think we, we just have a fundamental need to uh, be in touch with nature. Inside the Animal Mind, George Page. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs> 